Welcome to our podcast on solution development. This will involve a discussion about the different packages that we use in the computer application technology subject, like word processors, spreadsheets, databases, and web design. These topics are from question eight of the 2023 Computer Applications Technology November Theory Exam. There are three ways that you can engage with the content of this podcast. If you want to test your knowledge, then download the questions covered in the video by getting a PDF with the questions from the link in the video description. Then you can attempt these questions and then come back and listen to the podcast and compare your answers. Or if you want to use the podcast to learn new information, then first listen to the discussion, then download those questions that we mentioned earlier from the PDF in the video description, and then test yourself to see how much you remember from this discussion. Or you can simply enjoy the discussion and learn more about solution development. So now let's hear what our podcaster has to say about all these different packages. Welcome to this podcast where we're going to be talking about solution development in the CAT paper 2 2023 question 8 paper. It's going to basically be talking about features about Word, Excel, Access and HTML. Now for this podcast it's just me. I'll be doing the talking and I'll be going through these questions and talking to you as if you were listening and engaging in the conversation. So let's go talk about the questions from this exam paper and we can see what the answers were going to be. So we can start off nice and easy with a nice question about 8.1. It says is discuss two reasons why you would use page headers and page footers in a document and give an example of the type of information that can be included in a header or a footer. Well, the header and the footer are those sections right at the top of a page and the bottom of the page, the head at the top and the footer at the bottom. And whatever you put in them will be on multiple pages. So unless you make like section breaks and stuff like that, the content that you put on the one page will then duplicate itself onto the others. And so because of that, it makes it much easier to repeat information at the top of the bottom of every page. Sometimes we use it to provide a description of the document contents. That could be another reason. For example, if you look at your textbook, you'll notice that on one of the headers or footers of the one page, it'll tell you the name of the book. And on the other page, it'll say what the chapter is. So there, in that case, they've got different headers and footers for the odd or even page numbers. But it's still providing information about the document. Or it could, as I said, if it's providing information by the chapter, that's providing information by the different sections of the document. If you've got a document that you divide up into multiple different sections, maybe appendices, then maybe you want different information at the top and the bottom of those pages. And it also provides with easy navigation, just especially when it comes to page numbering. That's a really useful thing that can help us find a particular page. And so that leads into what part where we say give an example of the type of information. And there we said that page numbers are very prominent when it comes to particularly footers. You could include dates. You can include document information. What about the file name? What about the path of the file? Any types of properties or fields, there's tons available. The author of the document, uh, the subject, all those settings that are set in the Word document document you can have them displayed so that if they change the settings it'll still change the header and the footer so there are lots of these options available so all they wanted was two reasons we've given four and an example of something that goes into the header or footer right so let's go on to 8.2 here we're going to go into some excel information and they say that this formula at the bottom there equals sum b7 to b13 yeah, that's given a zero answer and we need to give two reasons for why it's giving a zero answer so we see the formula that we can't see the result but they say that it's a zero answer and the first thing that for me that sticks out is i see that b7 to b13 and you can see that column b is just a list of names of the items so it's Probably the incorrect cell range. I've got a funny feeling if they were going to do a sum, it would probably be for the column C, which has the actual prices. So that's one of the reasons why I think it's zero. We sum in text, which is not going to be useful. And then the other reason is maybe they do want to sum, I'm putting that in inverted commas, sum the column B. In other words, count how many items there are. And that's not a sum, that's actually a count. So maybe they use the wrong function. And remember, when you are counting text, you can't even use the count function. You must use count A because there's text involved. And as we said earlier, and the other reason is that we are summing a field that is text and you can't sum text fields. You can count it or count A it, but for the sum and the max and the min and the average, all those aggregate functions, those work ideally with number fields. You can't do that with text. So there we go. Those are two, well, I've given you three possible reasons why that formula is giving a zero answer. So let's get into 8.3 and let's talk about Microsoft Access. We have a field property setting such as validation rules that provide accuracy for data capturing 
but we must name two other additional field properties that can be used. So we're talking about the tables. And if you think about all those properties when you are in the design view of the tables, you'll remember that validation rules is one of them. But there's a whole bunch of other options that can help us make sure that we help with data capture, in particular the accuracy. So we're looking at improving accuracy for data capturing. That's where the focus is. And so first of all, I'm thinking about input masks. If you are looking at, for example, a registration plate for a car, you want to make sure that it's first three letters followed by three numbers followed by two letters and there must be capitals. Maybe there's a special code. So you want to have input masks when there is data that has to follow a particular format, like it's got to be some characters, some numbers, that type of thing. Then the other option is to use field sizes. That way we can limit people to a certain amount of space. So for example, we don't want them to go above 20 characters for something. An ID number can't be more than 13 characters. A telephone number or cell phone number can't be more than 10. So those are the types of things that you could do when you're trying to limit the person from entering data that's probably not accurate. And then default values, this will help prevent people having to type too much. So if there's a lot of data capturing and there's a particular field that is always the same field for majority of the cases, then it's very useful to the data capture just to make that a default value so that they don't have to change it every time. It's by default that. So for example, in a school situation, if I was entering all the new students into my school system, the default value for grade will be eight because majority of the new students would be eight. Doesn't mean we can't change the value in those default values. A just means that it'll start off with an eight and if we need to change it, we can. And let's not forget about lookup values. That way we can limit it to a bunch of options. Have like a drop down list box. You can only choose one of the following options. They can also help. So they're limiting to those possibilities. That's really useful. And also the formatting. So maybe you want to format the data in a particular type of date format or you want to format it as an integer. For example, you don't want decimal numbers for your grade. No one's in grade 8.3, you're in grade eight or grade nine. So you can do formatting to also help with the data capturing, improving that accuracy. Now let's look at 8.4. We're going back into Word and we're looking at a feature that will force certain text to move to the beginning of the next column. Ah, the key word there is column. If it said the next page, then that would be easy. That's a page break. But yeah, we're talking about columns. Now, if you remember your column settings, we said it already. We said page break, but yeah, we're doing a column. So it must be column break. Now, 8.5, we've got a criteria for our validation rule. We're jumping back to access. And there you can see that the criteria is less than zero or greater than equal to five. That less than symbol, you can see it's less than zero. So we want it to be smaller than zero. So we want it to be a negative number or it's possible for the number to be five. So that's equal to five or greater than five. So we want all the numbers that are negative or if it's five or more. So that's what I'm going to say when I do my explanation. I'm saying number, number must be less than zero or negative or it must be five or more. Another way you could say that is because we're taking all the negative numbers and anything five or more, we do not want the numbers in between, which are the numbers zero, because remember we're not including zero. We want don't want a one, we don't want a two, we don't want a three, we don't want a four, but we do want the five onwards so not to four are not allowed so that's how you would explain that validation rule but with those less than and greater than symbols i know a lot of people struggle with that so wherever the number is so we can see that that less than zero you can see the zero is at the end of the bigger portion of the mouth of that less than symbol i think of it like a crocodile so we want the zero to be the bigger number and we want the numbers on the other side of that less than symbol so we can see straight away that naught is the bigger number we want numbers that are smaller than that number and if you look to the other side, you can see that the mouth open end, which doesn't have any numbers on, that's what we want. We want numbers and you can see it's the bigger end of the mouth of the crocodile. So therefore, the five is the smallest amount. We want numbers that are bigger than it. I hope hopefully that makes sense for you. So let's look at 8.6. The following criteria appears for the username in a database query and we must explain the query. Okay, so what we've got here is we've got a like and the moment we've got like, then we're going to use wild cards. So there are two wild cards there. The first one is those question marks. The question mark wild card says, if you have a question mark, that means it must be replaced by a character. So it must have at least one character in that question mark. It can't be left blank. It, is, it can't be more than one character. It's one character. So because we've got two question marks, that means we're going to start off 
with two compulsory characters. They must be there. We can't leave them blank. There will be two compulsory characters. They can be numbers. They can be anything as long as there's two things there in the front. Then after that, it's going to be followed by the characters A and N. Those will be our third and fourth characters every single time because we're going to have two in front of it. And then our third and fourth characters will always be A and N. And then that star is another wild card. And that wild card is for any character or no characters. So it's possible that it's blank. So it could be two characters followed by A and that's it. Or it could be two characters followed by A and followed by any possible combination of characters for however many as we want. So this will always start off with two characters followed by A and at the beginning. So that's how I would explain this query for username. So let's go over to 8.7 where we've got some HTML. Yeah, we've got some code where we are inserting an image and they're looking particularly at what effect the height will have on this particular image. There you can see we've got the width. The width equals 120, but we do not mention the height anywhere. So a picture has a height and a width. If we don't mention one of them, then it will put the image into the HTML document proportionally it will resize the image if that width is not the same width as the actual image image will be resized to that width and the height will be in proportion it will maintain its aspect ratio if we do mention the height and we give it a value and that value that ratio of the height and the width is not the same as the actual ratio of the image then it'll distort it a little bit but that's why we always like to mention one of them so that it will adjust accordingly so that's what will happen if we don't mention the height and then I think this is our last question. We're going to go to 8.8. .8. We are going to give a reason why you would use this button. And the key word here is look, it's access database table. Now you probably you've used it the most often in a query when you are doing your groupings by queries. But in this case, they're not talking about queries. They're talking about tables. And when you've got a table of data, you can just click on that button and it will add an extra row at the bottom where you can do some aggregate functions, where you can do some sums and totals and so on. So you can show and hide the columns total. So by clicking on it, it'll show it at the bottom. If you click on it again, it'll make it disappear. And we use that column to, for example, do a aggregate function. We can sum a column or max a column or count or even find the average. So those are the options available to us. But remember, we are talking about tables. So we're not talking about groupings. If this was done in a query, we would talk about grouping the data. But yeah, we are just talking about totaling the data overall. I think that's all the questions for this podcast. I hope you found it useful. I know it's just me talking to myself, but I was actually talking to you. So that's fine. So remember, you can download the PDF with the questions. Hopefully you've got them. If you haven't done them already, then go try them again by trying to remember what you heard from this podcast. And hopefully that will help you with your exams. Good luck, everyone. Hope you enjoyed this podcast. Now, I know this is our Computer Terms channel, and obviously you must subscribe to the Computer Terms channel, but the content from here is going to be mainly available on our RTN Cat channel at Miss Long RTN Cat. So if you haven't subscribed to that, make sure that you do that. And remember, don't do it the long way, do it the Mr. Long way.